Good day, everyone. Uh, good morning, depending on where you're at. Good afternoon for, for others. So uh, we are extremely excited uh, today. And on behalf of the some 65 volunteers with the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools, I'd like to welcome you to our first ever uh, summer series, a webinar series that we're doing. We're calling it Summer Camp just to uh, just to kind of give it a name and everything to, to describe that this is what we have determined for this summer to be some really, really key issues that have come up. So we're doing a three-part series. This is part one. Um, I'd like to introduce, introduce our panelists over here. Many, many of you already know Scott Lord from Electronic Contracting uh, Company, and you all know Guy Grace from um, as a consultant, uh, former school uh, security director at Littleton uh, Schools in Colorado. So um, on behalf of all of us at PASS, we're just delighted to, to welcome you to this seminar series. Uh, we're going to do a, a, a quick 45-minute presentation, and then this presentation is being recorded, and we'll be able to archive this on the PASS website. You'll be able to watch it later on or to share this with your, your peers. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, today, we're talking about duress alarm, panic alarms, um, you know, the, the uh, devices that are being, in some cases, mandated in schools. And uh, to get started, I'd like to just share a little bit about PASS. Uh, you can see our, our website there, passk12.org. Um, the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools is a, a 501c3 uh, charitable uh, foundation, and we have come together, the 65 subject matter experts, board members, uh, we have people in oversight committees, education committees, we're all just here together to uh, help make our schools safer. That's what that's what binds us. That's what brought us together in the first place. Guy and Scott have been there um, with us since day one, uh, you know, clear back to 2014 when we first put the guidelines together. We're up to revision six of the guidelines now. So um, today, again, we're gonna talk about um, Alyssa's Law, which many of you already know about. There are states that are starting to adopt this my opinion is, is that we're going to see requirements in pretty much every state before long. So we're going to talk about some of those and talk about where we can find information. I put the website up here that we're using a lot. Uh, NSCA um, is an organization that tracks legislation. We can't do that through the C3 that we are with PASS, but we can sure do it with the Security Industry Association, NSCA, DHI, some of the partnering organizations with PASS. We can point to their legislative tracking things. Right now we're tracking nine federal bills that tie into some sort of duress alarm or panic alarm systems in schools and or compliance with Alyssa's law. So we'll we'll talk about some of those. Um, I'd like to point out that that when we when we talk about Alyssa's law, we're talking about state legislators that have put together bills, Many have been encouraged to put those bills forward through uh, school officials uh, and others, parent groups and, and whatnot. But for the most part, it mandates that public and in, in some cases some private schools now uh, have to be equipped with silent panic alarms for staff and students in some cases that directly notify law enforcement. And that's where we, we wanna talk about that. You know, like what is the best way to do that so that, that it's in compliance with the law, but it also follows the policies and procedures uh, that the school has laid out. So in some cases, um, many cases, these are five states that have already adopted Alyssa's law, uh, Texas being the, the most recent, just uh, in Tennessee, actually. Um, and you'll notice a trend there is that these are states where they've had major incidents occur. So, so we're, we're following a pattern here, and it's unfortunate that there has to be a major incident before something like this happens. It's not always the case, but but we're seeing a trend towards that now. Uh, here are some states that that uh, we're seeing have brand new bills in some cases, and in, in others they have been put on hold, and there'll be carryover bills into the next uh, legislative session. What I wanted to point out is in some of these bills they have different language that talk about manual activation, talk about silent alarms, talk about, you know, a light has to be to go on, no audible signal, but a light has to go on uh, in the school. So there's, there's language that's different from every state. 
Uh, Georgia is a carryover proposed bill right now. And in that particular bill, uh, we're seeing that mobile panic, uh, the word mobile is put in there. So that's a different variation to, to that as well. Um, in the state of New York, now there's an amended bill that just came out where, where they talk about, they've already passed Alyssa's law, but they're talking about a silent alarm now that could be wired panic buttons or buttons, wireless panic buttons or buttons, or mobile or computer applications. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, it's just a, a new legislator, a new lawmaker, a different lawmaker has reproposed something that would amend the bill that's already there or add to that. In New Jersey, um, one thing to note is that they have now a bill in place that is going to propose all non-public elementary and secondary schools as well. So it, so it was initially public schools. Now there's going to be an addition to that where it uh, proposed to, the, to be um, private schools as well. So um, the first part of that was just me simply uh, giving you background on there's there's five states that have Alyssa's law already in on the books, five more that are that have a proposed or a carryover, and now a new piece of legislation just came up in Massachusetts that we're tracking. And again, that website that was on there gives you um, a place to go and actually read the bill so you can see what's what's in those bills. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to guy and to scott and we're going to start getting into the you know the essence of our discussion today which is really to talk about what the past advisory committee uh is doing and talking about with with various uh issues that come up with Alyssa's law so so guy scott welcome again and um, i'm going to turn this over to you to talk a little bit about what are the common types of duress systems so Let's start with Guy, and Guy, maybe introduce yourself real quickly to the group and to uh, to talk about these duress systems you're seeing. Well, thank you. Regardless of Alicia's law, our 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 basically our advisory committee believes, and it's always believed, that duress is a vital life safety component for school safety. That's important to note, regardless of Alicia's law. So when we look at that, the purpose of a dress alarm is to allow a person under threat to quickly and silently call for help in the event of an emergency. Dress alarms are also called panic alarms, hold up alarms, or panic buttons. Intrusion detection systems and emergency communication and fire detection systems allow for an easy expansion of dress or panic buttons or similar technology to the system. These dress buttons can be used for active threats, weather emergencies, medical emergencies, and other security threats. Like intrusion detection, duress alarms should be monitored by a central station or 911 center. So, uh, Scott, you want to talk about the types of common types of dress systems here? Sure. Thanks, Guy. Um, you know, from the, the technology perspective, you know, just as we've kind of positioned in, in the past guideline is, you know, looking for ways to leverage technology that's already there that's in the intended purpose for life safety. So you mentioned fire alarm, you mentioned duress and intrusion systems that a lot of our schools might already have. So I think one of the key things to look at as schools are looking at how they want to do this compliance, how they want to do the duress, is what you currently have. Um, you know, from the life safety perspective, uh, you know, with me being having a fire science degree, um, you know, anything that's hardwired and can be supervised is probably one of the key aspects that a district should look for so that we know that that button will work, you know, that this system is tested. So, you know, just like you would a fire alarm system or a mass notification system, making sure that we are ensuring that the systems work. And I think, you know, Guy, you and I are going to get into more of the wireless um, when we talk about mobile duress, which is different than an app. So, you know, that's one of the things I think we, we will kind of touch on as we go through this. And then looking at just as we do in the tiers of the guideline is what's kind of the next level of what you can do with a duress button. So location services, so that we, we're site specific of where that button goes off, possibly being able to have that tied with audio and video so that we know what is happening with that event in a real time manner that the local law enforcement can move forward on. Uh, and then we'll definitely touch on the, the app based systems that are out there. 
Well, let's let's talk about that. And and already we're getting questions about the word silent being in there. You know, it's it's always an interesting thing. And 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 by the way, if you hear the term SPAT, um, it stands for silent panic alarm technology. Um, and people use that um, you know, it, interchangeably with with duress. But the the silent part of it um throws people off, Scott and, and Guy, because they're used to an emergency where alarm sound and audio goes out and, and all that. So the escalation of the situation, uh, it's it's felt could happen rapidly if it if it's an audible, you know type of, of thing or if it goes into an alarm, you know, an audible alarm. So it's kind of kind of an interesting um situation with that. But let's let's talk you mentioned apps, um, Scott and guys. So what, what you know and and I don't know. It's it's one of those terms that we throw around a lot, but but an app as it relates to an emergency notification or emergency situation, what what's the passive position on that? Well, emergency communication is vital to the safety and security of staff and students in our schools. It is important to distinguish between emergency and routine communication systems. An emergency communication system is by, defined by NFPA 72, the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code, as a system for the protection of life by indicating the existence of emergency situations and communicating information, information necessary to facilitate an appropriate response and action. Routine communication systems handle day-to-day -day communication on all matters outside this definition. So the use of a dedicated emergency communication systems and technologies is essential. Normal business telephone, email, and social media apps designed for routine communication are not adequate for critical communication during an emergency event unless they are specifically configured for this purpose in a code-compliant manner. So when we look at this, what you know when you look at that i believe and scott can weigh in on this we're you know we look at like how we deploy other types of security technology or in the fire section for example all of those devices are supervised and when we look at that that supervision of a duress system is absolutely critical into into this uh function of communication scott yeah, I agree. And I think one of the things to look at is going to be simple human behavior. So when we look at when someone's in an emergency situation, how do they react? So for example, when someone is in a, an active threat situation, there's documentation there that shows that while you have a phone and you have the ability to dial 911, 98% of the time, nobody does it. So if we have an app, so does this mean this is an app that's always open? How do they quickly get to it? Will they actually use it? And then the other side of that is definitely going to be when we're in these types of situations and it's normal and typical of what we've seen, whether it's a weather emergency, an active threat, um, you know, any type of even a major fire, that one of the problems that we run into is your cellular network is not rated to be able to handle that traffic. And the cellular network doesn't have a way to differentiate that this app should have priority from this app. I know from well, you guys that travel a lot, you know, I find that at airports. Any major airport that I go into at nine o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon, try to get a phone call or send a text message out. It's almost impossible. And so that's where when we look at apps, of we've got to look at that human aspect of it, of what are we geared and trained to do and what will we actually do in that fight or flight response? And unfortunately, apps make it uh, a little bit more difficult to do that. Plus, we can't really rely on the technology that's happening during that emergency situation because it's just not designed for it. Well, if you look at that screen too, of like what we're looking at, imagine trying to find an emergency preparedness app on a telephone, so to say. And you look at that screen like we're looking at right now, that's a lot to find. But also too, you you mentioned cellular. I think also the other thing is the, the, the local area networks in schools that a lot of school districts allow their staff to run their cell phones on there. 
Now, schools are generally pretty good in that area, but the coverage can be spotty in many for many school districts. So that's something you need to think about, that if you don't have a DAS system, you don't have uh, infrastructure in there to enhance the ability for uh, your, your LAN system to facilitate communication, that could be problematic. So really, in a way, before you even deploy these types of things, it's important, as we say in past, to do a risk analysis to determine if your infrastructure that you have can support what you want to do. You need to determine that before you do this. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, Guy mentioned DAS, that stands for Distributed Antenna Systems, and we're starting to see that becoming a requirement in schools too. So mm -hmm. so there's that, there's a, you know, kind of a, a situation going on there where where we have to we have to make sure that we have good cellular coverage in schools, even in the areas of rescue or refuge in, in those spaces. So mobile duress, um, you know, really what is it? And and in compliance with the LISA's law is how do we envision that happening? Well, we I could say I believe mobile dress is the future. It's really, it's here. You know, what when we look about 10 years ago, we had mobile address, but we did not have, you know, the specifics to find a, a true location of an individual. But mobile dress alarm systems consist of a wearables, wearable wireless uh, mobile device that staff wear while at work that will allow them anywhere on the campus to call for help. These devices generally have a simple design of being a small fob with buttons that, you, that the user would push to call for help. While different companies feature unique buttons or layouts on their devices, the best case endeavor is to have an emergency button to press in an emergency situation or situations. So what, you know, we look at schools and the type of hazards we deal with on every given day, there's many hundreds of different types of situations. So when we look at duress, it's not just for an active threat situation or active shooter situation, it should be for an all hazard situation. Scott? I agree. And I think one of the two things that we need to differentiate too, when we talk about mobile duress is just like you said, Guy, this is something that's dedicated to be able to do duress. You know, just like a fire alarm pull is for a fire alarm or a tornado warning um, alert, you know, where you have a, a certain button that you push to do that, is making sure that this is something that is completely dedicated to that because from that human nature standpoint, this is what makes that work rather than something like an app. The other thing on the mobile duress is this is also something that we can make sure is supervised. So, you know, can we supervise as everybody's phones on or off or their app is open? You know, with these type of systems, we know if the battery is getting low on that device. You know, we can track if it goes outside of a coverage area. Um, things like that so that we can make sure that this system is, is, is supervised and we understand that it's going to work every time and all the time. So, so what, what are those wireless system protocols that you're talking about there? Well, by necessity, mobile duress systems rely on wireless radio pro protocols to transmit alarms. So generally, we're looking at uh, radio uh, a lot like what you do when you see a wireless security system, say, in your house or somebody might have uh, IoT devices in their school district, like motion detectors. So it's basically the same type of wireless security protocols that dress systems use. But they also use, they could use Bluetooth, they could also use Typically, what you'll see is a Bluetooth network and then a wireless radio system or network that supervises this. But not all wireless technologies are appropriate for life safety systems, and there are unique considerations. Because the reliability could be a matter of life and death, the wireless backbone of a, of a mobile dress system must be fully supervised, as Scott mentioned, and able to withstand interference, overcome obstacles, and guarantee multiple paths from alarm device to receiver, and removed from common faults and downtimes that cellular connections, su cellular connections suffer from. Multiple wireless radio component capabilities for supervision and monitoring provide redundancy that can overcome a single point of failure. Such systems must also monitor the battery life, the operational status, and the wireless connection of all pendants or sensors. So you think about this, you're wearing this device, for example, 
you want to know if your staff walks off the campus with it or if the battery is going dead or going low or if this device is not communicating. That's the importance of that is to supervise that device and to ensure that it's going to work in an emergency. You know, sadly, that's the thing about an app. You don't know if it's going to work when you're going to push it. You can assume it probably 99% it's going to, but you want to be able to supervise and understand if that app is going, to, or excuse me, your device is going to work in an emergency. Scott? Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things there. When we talk about, you know, radio frequencies and wireless protocols and that, you know, Chuck had brought up. DAS and BDA systems now being required to be put in schools. You know, the majority of that is to make sure that our law, you know, our emergency responders have the ability to communicate using their walkie talkies. But those are also bands that are protected for emergency communication. Yeah. And a lot of your duress radio frequency devices work within that band. So as you alluded to, Guy, that makes sure that interference is not a problem because IoT type devices and other type of wireless technology that may be in the school can't compete in that band or in that range. So that area is free for just emergency communication. And kind of the same thing when you talked about Bluetooth of using a Bluetooth or near field type communication for people who are not technical, you know, a lot of people now you can use your phone to pay for things and you kind of do the, you tap and do this. Well, that's using Bluetooth or near field communication that's encrypted. Yeah. And so, but what we're doing is using that same technology, but just as you said, Guy, it's on a network that's supervised. So it is just looking for those devices and it's keeping track of just those devices, not every device that could possibly connect via Bluetooth. I would also uh, point out too that when we are talking about wireless system protocols is the unification with other technologies such as mass notification, such as locking the doors, lockdown, those types of things. Those are things that when you're considering your wireless system protocols, if you're going to uh, have an interface or an advanced protocol interface, for example, is making sure that you do your assessment beforehand of what you want to do. Because every system, we have some really good partners in the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools, and there are several of them that offer these supervised networks. You know, they'll have a Bluetooth or a similar network, and then they'll also have a network on top of that supervising these devices. Those are the, in my opinion, those are the ones you should be looking for right now if you're going to be looking for a dress system. Let's uh, let's talk about location as it relates to duress and distances and and these types of things so so you know the the panic thing you know could be as simple as a like a bank teller has a little button underneath their their desk if the bank's being robbed you know you can see something simple like that in a in a school secretary but but these things happen in the classrooms they happen in the gym they happen in the cafeteria the playground and all that how do, how do we know where where that device was initiated from well, basically, this means that when the dress button is pushed, that it will use the wireless network that the system utilizes and a Bluetooth or equivalent function to give a precise location. This will then alert whoever is on the other end of the alarm that they can they need help. Dress alarms can also be used to track the whereabouts of people that allow them to check in regularly. Different workers and people who are often in potentially risky situations will carry around a dress alarm to help keep track of their whereabouts for safety and purposes. So when you look at that, you look at these really good uh, with location services is the ability to drill down on a map and get the exact location of when that person deploys it. So when they're, you know, they're using that Bluetooth or the equivalent, that's giving a, you know, it's the range of that is is kind of is not extended, but having those two networks it ensures that you're able to get a, an exact location within the schools. And I think that's important when you're looking for a dress system is looking for a provider that has location services. And it's good to understand that. But you can't just throw this together. You have to do, again, as we talk about that, an assessment of that facility. So when you buy this is making sure that your integrator or your service provider is providing you with a good uh, site survey to ensure that location services is going to work in your school. Scott? 
Yeah, and I think when we discussed these, you know, we talked about hardwired systems as well as wireless systems. So when you have hardwired systems, you have those to be able to be addressed for that specific location. So we know what's happening. Um, but as Guy alluded to, you know, whether it's radio frequency, Bluetooth, um, other types of technologies that are out there, you know, they, those technologies should have the capability of triangulate and say they're within this area, you know, within 30 to 50 feet. Um, you know, those are the type of things that schools should look for when they're looking at their systems. Yep. I, th I think it's a super important element of that. And you know what I what I really like is our pass has the has been working a lot on the door numbering configurations and stuff so that we can correlate the location of the duress to the uh, the door or the entryway that the first responders should be should be using. So kind of a neat neat setup. Let's uh, let's skip to you know getting back to the whole thing about um, and summarizing you know, what things to consider here. So policy procedure, you know, ensuring that it fits the purpose that we're looking for, you know, like we, I had a school just yesterday ask, can I use a lifeline thing? You know, I've fallen, I can't get up and have it call to a, a service that would respond to that. Can that be used? And and it's like, okay, we got to make sure that what they're using in schools are designed for this application, just as part of the whole past philosophy that it's it's done that way. Uh, the network, you know, knowing what you can afford. So, guy, guy, what are you, what are your thoughts to start here with the considerations? Well, we talked about mobile address, but you know, when we think about policy and procedure, it's absolutely critical that that when you think about a implementing dress, that you're going to have this into your your people's roles and processes for emergency preparedness, where they're going to how you're going to utilize that in your active threat program or how you're going to use that in identifying uh, other types of threats that you might do well that the dress system might alert to. But another thing too is looking at how you're going to, you know, in the policy and procedure, how you, you know, what looking at how you're going to get these pol the, this technology to work with your other life safety components in the school, such as your mass, like we talked about mass notification or your access control system or locking the doors. So that is huge. So policy and procedure is a huge issue for school districts when you think about it. So discuss what constitutes staff and student and, law and LEOs. Model drills like fire alarms or active threat drills, but compliance with penalties for non-compliance. So basically, when you're thinking of Alicia's law, there's going to be compliance and penalties. And you need to think about that. What And as you, Chuck, alluded to, Scott the Chuckers, that there's a lot of different standards out there, but it's in you know, if you're going to be, you're in a state that you have to comply, you need to understand how you're going to comply. But medical weapons, bullying, intervention, mandatory reporting of attacks, uh, playground, angry parents, all of these procedures need to have a, a training and document that you have done those trainings. But also, too, I think about when we're doing this as well, again, it's so important you just can't throw a dress system into your school. You need to think about how it's going to impact the human rules and processes, how it's going to impact other technologies, and you have to train on it. And it's absolutely critical that training takes place. And as you know, uh, over the years with dress, it's 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 complicated, but it's absolutely necessary because when I look at dress. In my opinion, it saves lives and it's demonstrated that it saves lives, mm -hmm. especially with some of our partners here. And it needs to be, it's an important implementation for schools. I agree. And I think really the it comes down to, as Guy, you said before, is kind of looking at that risk assessment. So, you know, no one school is alike, you know, no one district is alike. So, you know, I look at it from the aspect of, if you look at a rural community where, you know, we don't have SROs, we don't have law enforcement that has a police station eight or 12 blocks away, um, you know, what are some of the emergencies that you work out with your local law enforcement of saying, what are the things that we do this? You know, if I have a school where the average response time is going to be 12 minutes, it might be different in how you actually deploy that system. Because if you feel that it's a threat in which you might want to have police involved, then really what we need is to make sure we get that message out. So, you know, maybe that hardwired solution is what's best because it's one building, you know, 
But when you start looking at ones where we've got multiple buildings across, you know, across the campus, that's when that location services becomes more important. That's where we start kind of drilling down to what do we have from a, a, a safety and security officer standpoint for that area and how would we address, you know, certain um, situations and what would those situations be? So those are the type of things that I think is important to work out while we're complying with Alyssa's law. What are some of the steps on how you're going to do it? And I can't reiterate enough what you said, Guy. We've got to drill for it. I know nobody likes tornado drills or hurricane drills or fire alarm drills, but the fact of the matter is, you know, from day one, kids know what happens when a fire alarm goes off, when a tornado drill goes off, you know, at least for me here in the Midwest. They understand what that means. And we have to make sure that we're doing those type of things with duress. And I I think too, you know, when when it's in service days before the new, you know, semester starts, the fall term starts, you know, is bringing the new teachers in, the existing, you know, staff, uh, bringing them all together to to describe really when do I push that button? That's what what it what it comes down to really for me anyway is knowing in our policies and procedures for that particular school when do I hit the button? Is it a a, a fight that we think is going to break out? Is it a medical emergency? Is it the all hazards? You know, do I if I suspect a student is having a seizure or I found drugs or something like that. Um, we had one school that a teacher saw a giant spider running across the floor, hit hit the duress button. I mean, that that isn't, you know, guy, this is your world, but that isn't what the intent of that duress alarm button is, I don't believe, right? You don't want the trucks to but, be rolling. But I would say to you, I would say to you, Chuck, and anybody that's implementing duress, you know, training is absolutely critical. But also, too, don't make people afraid to use it. I think that's important because if you make people afraid, then they're not going to use it. And when seconds count with these with this type, this is what this systems do is they are buying you time and, and seconds when seconds matter. And I think it's important to realize that is when you implement that, don't, you know, training is absolutely critical. But also too to make sure that you that when we train them that we're not going to make them intimidated in using this technology. It's absolutely critical not yeah. to do that. And, there's, and there's... let's make sure, yeah, let's make sure too that you know let's not recreate the wheel. You know, historically where have we seen duress alarms that sort of thing, they were in banks. That's where they started. You know, essentially. So what is the process of? oh, whoops, we probably shouldn't have hit it because it was a large spider. There are processes in place for that so that we, the law enforcement knows we're going to respond as, this, that, as if this is an emergency, but we might get a call from dispatch saying, okay, cancel that. Yeah. The same thing happens with fire. You mm -hmm. know, A kid pulls the pull station, the school calls and says, we're not on fire. You don't have to send the trucks. Mm -hmm. you know, so, I mean, making sure that we have those type of things that are in place and then agreement with our law enforcement so that you're right guy i'm not scared to hit that button because i'm not sure well maybe this is a bad idea you know we do need to have that plan in place but also being able to have that kind of after action reporting of saying mm -hmm. okay this is probably not the time that we should do something like that let's look at a different way that we um we, we communicate this threat to the appropriate personnel at the school. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to overcomplicate this. But I'm also going to say this too. My experience when we have given employees wearable pendants and staff, it has been a, basically you're empowering them. And we're, what this is, is this is an empowering tool. It helps those students to, it helps those staff members to feel safe when they're teaching. And also too, when the students know that the, the teachers can get help to them. And also just basically the whole thing about teachers ability to teach and students ability to learn. And that enhances the basically the instructional and you know, the safety awareness in your school. It's so important. And that's why I love dress. It's something that I've always enjoyed for many years, but I can tell you it's, it's, it's huge. It's, if it's done right, it will save life, but it will save lives, but it will also enhance that safety awareness in the schools. Yeah. And and one thing about duress and with Alyssa's law is we don't have a verification period here. So there is no 
there is no time delay to where we can run to the classroom and go see what's going on as an administrator or an SRO. We don't have that that time built into there. So there's going to be many occasions where we do have to stop the truck roll, but it, that's just the nature of it, right? Uh, it's, it, it is. And that's why too, if you're not doing, if you're doing mobile address and, or, and thinking about this is look at your other technologies. What kind of cameras do I have in the areas? What kind of audio monitoring devices and things? That's so, that's absolutely critical. Okay. Um, right. Go ahead. What fits the purpose? So, so ensure wireless technology fits the purpose goes back to, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up pendants all the way to, to what we're talking about here today for, to make sure that we're using the right technology for the application that it's designed, right? Well, when we think about that by necessity, mobile dress systems rely on, as we talked about, wireless radio protocols to transmit alarms. But not all wireless is appropriate for life safety systems. A life safety system requires a secure supervised wireless network removed from common faults such as downtimes and other wireless connections like cellular connections suffer from. Because of reliability could be a matter of life and death, the wireless backbone of mobile dress system must be fully supervised and must be able to withstand the interference. Again, we're emphasizing that. And overcome those obstacles and guarantee multiple pass from the alarm device to the receiver. One of the leading practices observed with dress systems is to seek a solution that has multiple wireless radio component capabilities for, super, for supervision and monitoring. Even if one of those radio components were to fail, the other component would still operate. Like any other successful life safety component, the dress system's infrastructure's health must be monitored. From the battery life of the pendants to the status of the receivers, all dress systems should be supervised to monitor that health of the connection between each dress sensor and the security panel, and every device should be automatically monitored to ensure it, oper it is operational without manual intervention. So dress systems should monitor the integrity of the wireless link between the transmitter and the receiver as well as the status of the transmitter. Testing each for low battery, tampering, and inactive conditions. If a transmitter malfunctions, the system should have the ability to provide a timely, intelligent alert message so security personnel can quickly and easily resolve the problems. The transmitter should check. Okay, so this comes from the fire code. The transmitter should check in every 200 seconds or less to provide an up-to-date status of the entire system. And dress systems should have communication protocols that eliminate the false alarms due to radio interference. That should also send a redundant information on multiple channels within a frequency band and provide superior reliability over frequency systems, which only send information on one narrow band channel. Moreover, a dress system should not interfere with other wireless security components at a school, as Scott mentioned. Likewise, it should not enter and not accept interference from any other wireless system. There is no room for error in this. It needs to be treated like a fire system is what, you know, what our past position has been. It needs to be supervised. And I'll let Scott elaborate that even more efficiently than I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think just like you said, Guy, it's, you know, the wireless technology that fits the purpose. There's so many things out there that I think our schools are trying to deal with today. We mentioned near field technology, we mentioned Bluetooth, we mentioned RF technology, we mentioned apps. All of that stuff uses some sort of wireless technology and you're correct, Guy, we need to make sure that the technology has the backbone that is secured from a life safety standpoint. And, you know, we do look at, um, NFPA as, you know, the leader that tells us this is how technology should be supervised, because um, that's what that's what they know the best. And so when we are looking at how this fits the purpose, that first thing is making sure that your technology has the capability to to um, meet those life safety applications, those life safety components. But on the other side of it too, making sure that your wireless technology fits the threat. Is putting a Bluetooth um, duress system in an 18 building school the best per way for that wireless technology, even though it meets all the things that are there? Or maybe are we looking at more of an RF system where 
it's three different devices out there so that the one that has the strongest signal, I'm going to tell you it's in this part of the building. You know, so those are the type of things that as schools look at this, and that's one of the things I think, Chuck, you kind of alluded to, and we talked about Alyssa's law, it doesn't really, the law doesn't tell us how really to comply. Right. So I think what we're trying to say is there are some things you need to make sure that you have in place, if nothing more than from that liability standpoint. And, you know, so making sure that that wireless technology is actually certified to do life safety. That is that is what the purpose of it would be. Um, you know, Chuck, you talked about the I've fallen and I can't get up. You know, mm-hmm. that 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 goes to different types of centers than centers that we're talking about that manage intrusion systems and fire alarm systems, you know. So those are the type of things that, you know, it, take away on the wireless technology is as you're evaluating those, just make sure that they are rated to be able to do that life safety. And it's from that commercial aspect. Yeah. And I would say that I, can, I fall in and I can't get up is, you know, is actually a good technology. Okay. It's saved lots of people in the past. And it is very similar to what, you know, we're doing in the K through 12. But like Scott said, it's a different kind of deployment, uh, how you would use it for a different type of audience, so to say. So, so yeah, go, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, guy. I was just going to say, speaking of compliance and best practices, talk about the network for a second. Well, dress systems like other security emergency communication systems, access control, video surveillance, and alarms, et cetera, should al- operate on dedicated physical security networks such as subnets or virtual local area networks as a VLAN. A VLAN is a virtualized connection that connects multiple devices and network nodes from different LANs into one logical network. VLAN should be separate from the district's primary operational networks at any student networks and any student networks networks with proper security controls in place. This approach not only provides better cyber protection for physical security systems, but also, and this is something I ran into as a security director, preserves the operation of these critical systems if the operational network fails for any other reason. That could be in an active threat situation. I can give you an example. Everybody is going to be going to your district when you uh, when you meet that. If there's a situation in your school and it's out there on the news or ki- other ki- kids or staff are texting, it's going to it could clobber your network. So what I'm what we're saying is, IT and physical security staff should meet on a regular basis to discuss the latest challenges and industry trends to be in the front of the threats as much as possible. If the district has a dedicated physical security department or a dedicated employee for this function, it's recommended that this department or individual create internal service level agreements with the IT department to perform IT tasks related to the security equipment, security related network and infrastructure. It is absolutely critical for the school officials implementing address system to understand how their solution will use the district's operational networks before, during and after an emergency. It is also important to understand how the DRESS systems will access external resources such as the cloud to operate and to ensure that they operate when emergencies happen. So this is going along your risk assessment. This is something that you need to determine beforehand. Scott? Yeah, I agree. I think really the biggest thing on this is, you know, we've talked about it from um, the the technology standpoint, whether it's access control, video surveillance, a lot of the stuff that's gone to the IT, if we can physically be segregated, that makes the that makes life a lot easier. But when we're dealing with wireless technology, and a lot of our schools are starting to do that with different types of networks, a guest network, a you know, a student network, a admin network. And with that, just as you said, Guy, making sure that we are prioritizing whatever life safety systems that are going to use that type of technology, that they're getting the priority, that those devices don't lose that connection. So, you know, those are the type of things to look at when we're doing this. And just as you said, making sure that if it's possible, do some of that bench testing. When our network's overloaded, can we, is the system still working? And if it's not, what is our backup plan? You know, and how are we alerted? that maybe that traffic that we're having or the issue that we're having, what is our backup plan when that happens? How are we notified? And how do we make sure that we've got, you know, a, another plan? 
segregating the networks helps make sure that you know while you might need a backup plan it's not as critical Excellent. So, so a lot of questions about what do these systems cost already here? I'm looking at, looking at all the Q and A here is, you know, this is, this is a, such a tough thing because, you know, one could say, you know, there, there is no price that, you know, tag that on, on a human life kind of thing. There's, there's so much funding out there available now. Do you, do you guys have any general concepts of, of what, like say the, the wireless duress alarm systems would, would cost in schools or how do we know how much we can afford, I guess? Well, I look at, you know, we have some very good partners in past. We have service providers and integrators. And I think that's important is to determine what you can afford. A good practice is that your mobile address system can integrate with your existing security system. So it does not require an entirely new network infrastructure. My leading practice in school safety is the AVAX technology implementation should further the unification of security and life safety components related to a school district security systems. So unified systems address the difficulties of integrating technologies across platforms within the connected environment in which they reside. Properly implemented, a unified system eases integration of new components and allows the district to continue and evolve and span. But I would also say too that when we look at this stress system, and you know, look at our white paper that we put out or that, that technical paper that we put out. There are, you know, we look at, there's two types of providers. We look at a service provider, which will do everything for you, lay it out, or an integrator model where you have an integrator install it and you own the system. But what I, I say there are pluses and benefits with both the integrator model and the service provider model. And that's something for the school district to explore. So when you're doing this, my recommendation, just like any other life safety component, is bring in several vendors and 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 look at them and look who's going to, you know, who has the proven track record and who has the what's the solution that's going to fit best with your district in affordability and deployability, and also going to work with your people's roles and processes. Again, this isn't just something you throw together or let slide down the wall. What you need to do is you need to look at this, this and find the best solution that's going to fit for your school district. But I will say to you, as we talked about, one of the gentlemen asked a question, you know, for example, you know, like when you have a Bluetooth or, you know, how far the devices is, is how, when you act that service provider, or that integrator, how you're going to ensure that your devices are going to work when they are absolutely needed. That's absolutely critical. And which leads us into the try before you buy. <laughs> so, you know, when we look at that, a pilot program, a, pri a pilot project is a good course of action for a district to take when choosing a dress system. There are many benefits to a pilot evaluation of new technology prior to full-scale implementation, including the collection of data on its performance, refinement of processes, and even finding additional beneficial uses. Many manufacturers and integrators will provide products and services that could be tested by end users in a small controlled location before they are deployed on a larger scale. So when you talk about those 18 buildings like Scott, you could try them in one building, do a pilot program. Mm -hmm. You know, pilot is the try before you buy is absolutely critical here was what we're, we were recommending try before you buy. And a lot of a lot of your manufacturers and integrators, I'll speak from the integrator perspective, you know, going out and doing a pass assessment for a school. That's something that we want to do to be able to say these are the type of technologies that we think will work best and we can provide you with some of those budgets. And I think it does kind of come back to with the guidelines looking at the tiers you know we we kind of say as we look at the tiers of you know the tier one is something that could be done in three to six months with a minimal cost what's minimal cost to one district from another i can't answer that but you guys kind of understand what that is you know that tier two is something where we might you know we can look for funding over the next year that we can put that in so a lot of this is looking at what do you look at from your budget standpoint and that'll help kind of tear in where that technology is and then you can take that time to step back and say what do we actually want our ultimate goal to be and now we can start evaluating what type of technology we're looking for get some of those budgets as well as trying to get one of those pilot programs established 
so that you can make sure that what we do need to fund is exactly what we need. Awesome. I need to uh, start wrapping up here. Uh, this has been awesome, you guys. So I, I appreciate it very much. So, so just in, in summary, and and again, Alyssa's law. Uh, in many many people look at it like that. That's a, a, a you know kind of like a minimum, if you will. That's a minimum requirement to have that. Most of the time, we're seeing things integrated. And and somebody brought up a great question about that. And in regards to what is Pass's position about the silent nature of that duress going out, you know, so, so a teacher in a classroom, let's say hits their pendant, gets a, a duress notification, a light goes on in the school, but shouldn't that school officials be taking action while the trucks are starting to roll then from law enforcement. So they, the integration possibilities, some of the technology we're seeing from our partners is awesome in that in that it can start the activation of some some local things as well uh, going on. So just just in summary, um, I wanted to go through a couple of points about the professionals, the experts. Uh, one thing to look at, we got several of our partners now that um, you can go to the past website and look at about and then look at a list of past partners. And there's a there's very reputable companies that this is their profession, along with the integration community that are often resellers of these products, is to go in there and, and take a look at that. Um, understand the regulatory environment. You know, that's what that's what our subject matter experts are are um, kind of uh, have an area of specialty through through the work that they're doing. Each of the past component levels have have breakout groups, if you will, that are experts in this thing, duress and alarm being one of them. And so, you know, think about the location, think about the type of school, think about, you know, the playgrounds, this, the athletic fields and the distance from that building to those things to talk about, you know, when you try before you buy kind of thing is what is that range that we're looking at there? Um, you know, you don't want to hit a button out back and have it show up at the front door kind of thing or or whatever. So th there's just a lot of things that we can do to, you know, to do that site survey, that risk analysis and to and to make sure that we're we're properly fitting the technology to that that particular school and that application. So so really, you know, just just know about you know, how we want to configure this, how we want to seek the funding. Fortunately, there's so much funding available for things right now that I, th I think it's just, uh, it, it's awesome that we're not, we're not dealing with a lot of unfunded mandates here. We're dealing with a lot of funding for applications like this mobile duress and, and compliance here. So um, with that, um, I think I've been able, I've been monitoring all the questions as we go here. I think I hit most of them. But if for some reason you had a question in that I didn't embed within the, the conversation here, um, let me know. And there, there's just so many of them, I couldn't possibly get to them. We have a huge audience today, by the way. So there, this is awesome. It shows the need for what we're doing. And, and um, you know, speaking on behalf of the volunteers that make up PASS, uh, it's, so, it's, it's, it's such an interesting organization because we have thousands and thousands of subscribers, people that have downloaded the guidelines, implemented them. Like I said, we have 65 volunteers here, you know, the three of us and many, many others that are really, really good at this and have, have experienced tragedy in their lives. They've Some have experienced the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, school resource officers and safety directors, administrators. So we come from a wide background of, of people that that put this past guideline together. And we're we're really proud of the work that our volunteer team has has done. I'm so thankful for for everybody's efforts here. So um Guy or Scott, any parting words before I close things up today? Well, I, I look at these uh, some of these questions and uh and we look at the the price points, for example, are gonna differ just to say from, you know, if you're gonna go for a simple button, so to say, or panic button in a school that's hardwired, that that might be a little cheaper for you to do, but you're not going to have mobile dress. So like we said, the, the thing about the pricing is going to vary from an integrator model to a service provider model, but to the capabilities you want. So think about that is try before you buy and see if it fits your budget. It would be that the, the, the option I would say to suggest to anybody. But I would also say to you, regardless of Alicia's law, you know, this is absolutely critical for schools to do. And 
that's just my thought is that's why it's so valuable to me seeing this save lives. But I also think too that, you know, regardless of malicious law, schools should be looking at doing this in their school districts. Scott? Yeah. I think yeah, a couple of things in looking at some of the quick questions that we saw on Alyssa's laws, recognizing just as you said, Chuck, Alyssa's laws is minimum. Um, I take it from the life safety aspect of the silent alert is the silent alert alerting that local law enforcement is going to arrive at the building. If your policy and procedure and you feel that an audible communication for staff and students for what your internal policy should be in a duress situation, if audio is something that you feel is important, then that can be there and yeah. probably should be there. I think that's where, um, at least I was for a while, hung up on the silent. Yeah. So the silent is really, this is the notification that local law enforcement are going to respond. That's information that no matter what your threat is, the people that are in the building don't necessarily need to know. And maybe it's your bad guy, just like the panic alarm at a bank, okay? They don't know that it went off, but law enforcement is responding. And so when we look at some of the things like the Alice training, where we talk about how do we communicate with you in, in a lockdown situation, that's more internal. So, you know, I think when we look at the Alyssa's law and how we make sure we comply, you know, as Chuck said, that really is a minimum. And to take a look and say, okay, what are our procedures on how we want to keep ourselves safe, understanding that one of the things that we have to do is make sure that we are transmitting something to local law enforcement over a supervised life safety type communication platform so that they can respond to that emergency. Well, and I would say, what and elaborate on that, that customization about it's going to depend from school to school who who's going to know and who's not going to know. But when we start to tie things into mass notification of a lockdown, you're you know, if you look at you're going to have alerts, everybody's going to know. But those are things that you're going to have to sort out through your people's roles and processes. Right. Yep. Excellent. OK, so we're right on on time here today. Uh, we've had a tremendous audience here and they've stayed the, the entire time, which is a, a really good sign for our webinars. So. Uh, thanks, Guy. Thanks, Scott, for your your time and all the hard work that went into the the guidelines. I mean, a lot of people don't know we meet every Thursday on this kind of stuff, and then we have another group that meets every Friday, and it's it's just been a a tremendous uh, response from from our industry and our uh, education professionals and parent groups alike to support the PASS organization. So I, I'm just thrilled with all that. Um, Next week, same time next week, exactly a week from now, we're doing uh, the second part of the webinar series on mobile and digital credentials, which is really about, you know, thinking about using a smartphone to access, uh, open and close the doors and um, on the outside of the buildings, inside the building. So it's a, it's a trend that we think uh, we're getting a lot of inquiries about. So we're doing a webinar on that. And then on August 2nd, at the same time, we're doing um, a, in a, correspondence to a white paper that we just posted last night as talking about secured entryways, vestibule, ballistics, the glass, the film, and all that. So that'll those will be very uh, well received and very, uh, we got a great program for those two as well with some real uh, knowledgeable subject matter experts there too. So thank everyone for your time today. Um, you know, join us in our mission to make schools safer is all I ask and to share this information about PASS, everything we do is at no cost to the uh, school professionals and the educators out there. So we just want to get this uh, information and knowledge in as many people's hands as possible. So thanks, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time and effort today.